Hey, it's great to be with you. I was here a few years ago, and uh, I was so excited to be able to come back. I just, uh, I really love this this tribe, your tribe of people, and uh, so many great friends that are part of Converge, as well as just the great work that you are doing. Uh, Scott Rideout, thank you for your leadership and all that you're providing to uh, this great network of pastors and leaders, and uh, to Lynn Winters and others. I'm really honored to be here with you, and my goal tonight with you is very simple. I just want to kick this off with you by just reminding you of that core identity that we all have in Jesus Christ to seek and save those who are far from God and help them come back to him, very simply. And this is important. You know, I was on a flight from Atlanta to Las Vegas in a different season in our ministry. I pastor a church out in Las Vegas, and um, on this flight, every flight, it was Friday afternoon. Every Friday afternoon flight coming into Las Vegas is sold out. So yeah, I hate flying back into Las Vegas on Friday afternoon. It's always sold out. It's always like sardines, and everybody on the flight is rowdy because why are they going to Vegas? Which, by the way, just, you know, Las Vegas gets a reputation as being Sin City, but the people that are doing all that stuff are from your towns. They fly into our towns, and then they fly back to your town. All right, can we all just agree on that? We, do, we, we own a little bit of that, but you own some of that too is what I'm saying. So anyway, this plane's packed out. I'm sitting in the back. I mean, and, you know, we go for about two hours, and I'm tired. I'm facing a lot of leadership challenges in our church. There's a lot of stuff going on. And the guy next to me has had several different drinks, you know, two hours in, and all of a sudden he holds up his, his beer cup, and he starts singing this song. 99 bottles of beer on the wall, 99 bottles of beer, take one down, pass it around, 98 bottles of beer, and then everybody in the back part of the plane on an American Airlines flight starts singing 98 bottles of beer on the wall, and they sing, you know, and at first it's kind of cute, it's like, wow, we're on an American Airlines flight going into my city, and we're singing 98 bottles of beer on the wall, 99 bottles of beer on the wall, and they sing it all the way down, 97, 96. 95, at this point it starts getting annoying, 93, 92, 91, now you're wishing somebody would put you out of your misery. They sing it all the way down to 80, and finally somebody on the plane's like, one bottle of beer, and it's like, yes, go with that. And I remember this moment on this flight, it was one of the lowest moments I've ever had as a pastor. As we're flying along and everybody's having a good time and they're all tipsy around me and they're singing along. And I remember I just looked out the window. I was in the window seat and I just started to pray. I wish I could tell you I was praying for the people around me, but I wasn't. Except that maybe they would pass out and be quiet, you know. I was frustrated. I was tired. Frankly, I didn't feel like I was making much of a difference. You ever just, it was just one of those moments. And my prayer went something like this. I, Remember, I just said, God, I don't know how much longer I can do this. I mean, why did you call me to this place? What's wrong with you? Obviously, it's not working. Everybody around me singing 99 bottles of beer on the wall. I don't feel like we're making a difference. I don't feel like the ball's moving down the field. And truthfully, it was like a Moses moment. You remember Moses in Numbers 11, 11? The Israelites are grumbling and complaining. He's facing all kinds of challenges. And finally, Moses has just kind of had enough. And he says to God, he says, God, why did you give me the burden of all of these people? Remember this? He says, the, the weight, it's just too much. And he literally says, if this is how you're going to treat me, just kill me now and put me out of my misery. And I'm flying on that American Airlines flight back into Vegas, and I'm like, God, just take me out, man. I can't do this anymore. I was tired. I was worn out. I was exhausted. Listen, if you've never felt the weight of Moses' prayer, you will. And if you've been in ministry very long, you have. You know the weight of that 
prayer. Maybe when you get the 500th email about the style of worship in your services and how somebody, you know, didn't appreciate it. Maybe when you get the letter about, you know, somebody who was offended by the perfume somebody else was wearing. How can I be responsible for the perfume somebody wears in a church, right? Maybe when, you know, you have that 50th counseling appointment with the same people, you know what I'm talking about, and you're driving home and you're just like, God, I don't think it's making a difference. You know, maybe after service when the same four people pin you up against the corner and start having a conversation with you and you've ministered to them and counseled them and coached them and walked with them and loved them and prayed with them and all you really want to do is get around those four people to say hi to everybody else, but here they are again. Extra grace required. Every weekend, here they are. Or maybe it's when you do your church plant and tambourine woman shows up. Tambourine woman has to show up at every church plant at least once. You know what I'm talking about? You still got tambourine woman, right? I don't know what church she came from, but but she's already a believer, but she came to your church because it's like she's going to sit on the front row and whip that tambourine out. Or if it's not tambourine woman, it's flag woman. We actually had this recently at one of our campuses we started in, uh, in Arizona, believe it or not. And Man, not only did she whip the flag out, she starts sprinting across the front with the flag. It's like, somebody take down the woman with the flag. Can we do this? But do it gently. (laughs) Or not. And you get to those moments where you just think, God, I don't know how much more I can take of this. I'm not sure it's working. I I need help. I need your intervention. Well, friends, that's where I was on that flight. And over the last uh, season, God has really restored in me the joy of ministry. And I know some of you are probably there today in your own life. You know what it is to feel like butter spread over too much bread. (laughs) And you're just so thin right now and tired and frustrated. But I want to just encourage you tonight to reclaim some of that joy in ministry. And the way God restored that joy to me was in two specific ways. One is by simply rejoicing in him. Here's what I'm convinced of. If you will rejoice in God again, you will rejoice again in what he's called you to. If you'll simply rejoice in God again, you will rejoice again in what he's called you to. And as he began to restore me, as I just began to focus back on him and just worship him and celebrate him and acknowledge who he was in my life, I began to love again my calling. The second thing I did was I started just stripping away all of the other things and coming back to why I went into ministry in the first place, why you went into ministry in the first place, which was to help people come to know the grace and love in Jesus Christ that I had experienced in my own life. When I was 17, I walked through the doors for the first time of a church on my own terms. And I'd been wrestling through a four-year drug addiction and that church community, they loved me, they walked with me, and I can promise you this, when I walked up to the doors of that church, I was not asking, is this church missional or attractional? Because you know, I wasn't asking theological questions. I needed help, and I needed hope, and I needed people that loved me around me. And that's where the world really is, friends. Theology is important. All of those things matter. But where people really are is they need help, and they need hope. I walked through the doors of that church, and I got involved in a little Bible study. And I look back today, and I realize God saved my life, and he did it through the church community. So I want you to know I love the church. I love the church. It's imperfect. It's messy. Sometimes tambourine woman shows up. I understand, but I love it. God uses the mess of the church to reach a messy world to point people to a perfect God. And we get to be a part of that. And so for me, I came back to the simple message that I get the privilege of serving God. I have a friend of mine that uh, he he texted me this simple line once. He talked about some hard thing he was going through, but then in all honesty, he simply said this line, isn't serving the Lord awesome? And I've started waking up in the morning, and my first thought is often of all the things I have to do and what's coming in the day, and sometimes there's some dread there or whatever. I've been waking up, and this has been my first thought in the morning. I just say it out loud. Isn't serving the Lord awesome? It's amazing how it can shift your perspective. 
And then I get to face the day serving him. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to follow along, let's look at one of my favorite stories. It'll be dear to many of you, Mark chapter 2. It's really just a story to call us back to the simple mission of helping people come to Jesus. Because the truth is, friends, we've got a lot of churches in our uh, country. We've got a lot of churches in the world. And a lot of them are plateaued and declining. A lot of them used to be on mission. And now they're more like monuments to what they used to be. And if we're not careful, we can end up in the same place. Because the way a church goes from being on mission to being a monument or a memorial is the leader begins to go from being on mission to being a memorial to something that happened in the past. So we have to look at our own hearts. We have to keep our own hearts engaged. We have to be careful to be full-time followers of Christ and not simply full-time pastors and church planters and leaders and let God begin to shape us in the middle of that. Mark chapter 2, these guys love their friends enough to bring, their friend enough to bring him to Jesus. And here's what it says. Let's pick it up in verse 1. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. And soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. I love this. So the house is packed. You know, there's people there. Jesus is teaching. It says, while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Now, I love this story. Here's these guys. They're carrying this paralyzed man on this mat. This guy wouldn't have had it any authority, wouldn't have had much of a pull in his life. He would have been uh, living a pretty tough existence where he'd be picked up on this little mat. He'd be carried to a public place. He'd be set down. He'd have to hold his hand out and beg all day long. There's no insurance benefits. There's no disability benefits, right? Then he'd be picked up at the end of his day shift and taken back to whatever uh, his home was, and he would be set down, and then it would happen all over again the next day. This guy had no power, no influence, no leverage, but here's what he had. He had a group of friends who loved him passionately, loved him enough to take a risk, who believed that with all their heart that if they could just get him to Jesus, things would be different. And friends, that's what the church is. The church isn't simply this big corporate structure trying to get people to come to its building. The church is a living organism of people who love and care about those far from God so passionately that we'll seek them out and do everything we can to bring them to Jesus. Because we know if they just come to a place where they will believe and trust in Jesus, he will take care of all the rest in their life. And yes, I believe fully God is sovereign. And I believe God is the one that changes people's hearts. But what the tension I see in my Bible as I read it is I'm the one who's called to fully engage as if it's all on me, to depend as if it's all on God, to work as if it's all on God, but also to work as if it depends on me. And to know that God's going to sort all that out in his own sovereign way as we do all that we can to bring people to him and introduce them to Jesus. Friends, we don't simply need new churches. We need new churches on mission to bring their friends to Jesus. And so one of the first challenges that we see in this passage in Mark 2 is to love people even in the middle of their mess. To love people in the middle of their mess. I remember a few years ago I was walking in Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas with a friend of mine. And he did something I've never seen anybody do before or since. We're walking along. I'm looking at him as we're having a conversation. I'm literally looking at his face. He's mid-sentence. He's actually mid-word. And in the middle of this word, he just threw up. I mean, there was no, like, warning. There was no, hey, you know, I'm getting a little sick or something. Literally. Have you ever heard of this? We're just walking along, having a conversation. In the middle of the conversation, it's like, anyway. Bro. And so I'm a sympathetic vomiter. You know, I watch this happen, and I'm already like, oh, man, this is, this is not good. You know, what do you do with that? And, and so we, we kept walking. We took a few more steps, and I said, are you okay? He said, I feel better now. Wow, okay, I didn't know, didn't know you didn't feel so good to begin with. And I said, well, there's a restroom back the other way. Would you like to, to go back there? Maybe, maybe that'd be you know, good. We'll get you back to the restroom. He says, yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. So, so we turn around. Now, there's people all around us. We're walking along. We're about 15 feet now on the other side of the scene of the crime because we, we just kept walking. I don't know what you're supposed to do when somebody just throws up mid-word. You don't stop. You know, it's like, hey, you just threw up. 
So we just kept walking. So we turn around now, and we're sort of in the flow of people going back the other way. I haven't even thought about the mess that's been left behind. I'm just thinking about my friend here and what's going on, you know. And, and so as we're walking, about the time we turn around, I look up, and this woman walks right into the middle of, of the mess. Both feet fly up, and she goes right down on her backside. It was as bad as you think it was. And I remember this moment where she lifts her hands up and she says, what's this? <laughs> and yes, I did think that's Mexican food, but you don't want to know what that is. And so about this time, we're, we're moving closer, and two of her friends come up beside her, and they help her get up on her feet, and, and she gets up on her feet about the time we get there, and, you know, I, I don't really know what to do, right? This has happened, and, and her friends have already helped her up, and then I got my buddy over here, and he looks like he could go again. He's a ticking time bomb. He's already shown. He can, he can let it go at any moment. No forewarning. So I just sort of looked at her and nodded like, hey, God bless you, you know, and we kept right on going. And we kept walking, and he threw up again and again and again. It was crazy before I got him to the, uh, to the restroom. But I tell you that story because if you ask me, that is a picture of ministry. There's a lot of ways you could look at that picture, right? Sometimes you're just walking along, and you're minding your own business, and you don't want any more mess than you already have, and you, you certainly don't need any more mess, and you walk right into the middle of a mess. Maybe you created it, maybe somebody else created it, and you find yourself feet up right down in the middle of it. Or sometimes you're walking by, and the mess has happened, and you're trying to make hard decisions because you need to help this person in the mess, but you're also walking with this person who's making a mess everywhere they go. Ministry's messy, and when somebody's in a mess, they don't really need us to just come along and go, hey, you're in a mess. That's messy. What they need is for us to help them up, right? They need us to live in the tension of grace and truth as we serve them in our lives and to help them up. And so often we come along and we say, hey, you know what? You're in a mess. You're in a mess because you sin. And because you sin, that's why you're there. All true. But we also need to throw our hand out there and say, Jesus can forgive your sin and he can help you and we're willing to help you and we'll walk with you and let us help you up. Listen, ministry is messy because sin is messy. Get over it, get a mop, and start helping people clean up. It just is. And so... In the real world of ministry, as you know, we've got to love people in the middle of the mess. And it is a mess. It's easy sometimes in Bible college and seminary in our early days to, to think, man, it, in black and white categories of sin and grace and salvation. It's easy to come out of, of those environments and think, well, you know, if a person's living this way, then, you know, I'm going to tell them this. And if a person's living this way, then I'm going to tell them this and, if, and to have it all sort of worked out. But isn't it way more complex in the lives of friends that you actually make who are living their lives and they're, they're hurting and they're broken and there's this tension between grace and truth. And here's what I want to suggest to you, that there's no absolute place that we draw the line between grace and truth in our ministries. It depends on the ministry and the context and the situation and the person. Some people, they need a little more truth than grace. Some people need a little more grace than truth. Some seasons, wherever you're at, you know, it's hard. It's complicated to figure out how you navigate that. But if you're going to stay on mission and bring friends to Jesus, then you've got to be willing to be a little messy and to help them find him. Look at this, Mark chapter 2, verse 4. It says they couldn't bring him to Jesus. They're trying to bring this guy on the mat because of the crowd. So check it out. They dug a hole through the roof above his head. And then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. I love this story. It's so good. You know, Jesus is teaching, greatest teacher to ever live. He's unpacking the word of God. These people, they're packed out. The house is packed out. He's packed out outside the house. And these guys show up, and they look around, and they're like, I don't know, man. What do we do? I don't know. Well, let's go up on the roof. Okay. And so somewhere they get the idea, they go up on the roof, they carry the guy up on the roof, and they literally start pulling the roof back, which, by the way, have you ever wondered what was going through the mind of the owner of that house? 
think it was John Ortberg who said, you know, that you, imagine this, you're, you're sitting there and you're like, your prayers, right? Dear God, um, Jesus came over, he's hanging out, and, um, you know, the roof just got pulled off. Like, does this count as an act of God? So here the roof getting pulled back, all of a sudden, you know, the thatch, which they were pretty easy to replace in the time, it wasn't that big of a deal, but the, the thatch is getting pulled back, it's falling down, and they lower the guy down to Jesus. That's messy. But they were willing to do whatever it took to bring their friends to Christ. I remember when I first moved to the Las Vegas area, I did not know what I was getting in for. And I remember this couple that I met, we became friends, and I invited them over uh, to our house to, to join us for a Bible study. And uh, so they started coming to our house, and they joined us, and then began to realize, I began to put some things together, that uh, this couple was, they were brand new to the spiritual journey, they were just starting to ask some questions, and um, they were living together. He was an adult dancer at one of the lead male shows on the Strip, and she was an adult dancer at one of the lead female shows on the Strip, probably the most visible female in Las Vegas in that season. She was on every billboard. You would have seen her at McCarran Airport. She was everywhere. And so we start journeying with this couple. They met in our home every week. We just loved them. We just showed them nothing but grace. But then we started to introduce some truth, have some conversations with them, talk to them about sin and Christ and Jesus. And one of the ways you engage with people who are far from God is you don't, you don't have to preach to them. Ask them questions. Let them talk about it themselves. And what's fascinating is how many times people, like in our conversation, they were acknowledging me, yeah, you know, we definitely feel a tension between our faith and what we do every night. I didn't have to tell them that. They got there. So we journeyed with them. Now here's, here's where it gets messy. They eventually got baptized. That was cool. They got married. That was cool. They attended the church regularly. We were thrilled for them in that. They started studying their Bibles. That's cool. They even came up to me one day and said, Judd, we've started to tithe. Awesome. But they were still dancing five nights a week on the strip. <laughs> I'm not telling you I approve of that. I'm just telling you that's what reality was. What do you do? Now, it's easy in the classroom to sit back and say, well, at some point you throw the truth down and you walk away. You dust your feet off and you say, you know what, until you get it worked out, we'll be over here. But it's way more complex in relationships. And we would press the truth a little bit with them and they would start pulling back. And so we'd just love them a little more and show them more grace and keep praying for them and they would start leaning in. And this went on for years. At one point, to tell you how messy it really was, these were the people under my personal spiritual care and Bible study, by the way. At one point, they both stopped dancing. We had a huge celebration. We were thrilled for them. No secret about that. You know, we're like, awesome, moving into a new chapter in our life. And they moved into the new chapter, and they were doing great. And then she went back to dancing for a while. I'm like, did we not listen to anything I said? Is nothing getting through here? It's complicated. I remember the week they told me they were tithing, I was speaking to a group of pastors in uh, Virginia, and I said to them, you know, I'm so excited that my friends, I told them the story, but, you know, I'm so excited that they started tithing. And honestly, I could see the look on their faces, which is the look some of you probably already know. Um, the look on their faces was one of shock. And it dawned on me. I just said it out loud. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. You guys are way more bothered that we took money from people who were dancing than you are about anything else. And I said, you know, that thought hadn't even crossed my mind. Because truthfully, when you're working with messy people, you celebrate every spiritual victory, every spiritual step, every inch they move closer to Christ, you celebrate that. Now, I thought about this story again, because uh, recently I got a, a text message from this friend of mine, his name's Daryl. He and his wife Jennifer had married after that, as I mentioned, and then eventually they both kind of left the adult entertainment industry. They continued, they had their first child, they started raising their child. If you saw them today, they're like, they would be a model family in your churches. They would show up every week, they would serve, they would volunteer, they know their Bibles, they read it, they study it, they share their faith with others. I mean, they would be absolute 
awesome church members. They moved to the eastern part of the United States a couple years ago, and uh, he sent me this text message recently, and it was a video of the first message he gave in the new church that they started attending, where now he's teaching the entire youth group. Now, I teared up. I'm not ashamed to admit it. Ten-year journey. A ten-year journey. And it was messy all the way until the end, and it just began to snowball. But here's what I want you to see and, and remember. In that tension, there's no textbook for when you show grace and when you lean into truth. In that tension, there's no, there's no universal answer for when you sit down with somebody and say, look, you have got to deal with this in your life. Or when you pull back and you say, you know what, I'm just going to keep loving you and keep trying to lead you, and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do his job. It's messy. And I just want to encourage you to embrace that mess and know that you're not alone in it. Because when you're in that mess, sometimes you want to look out that window like I did on that American Airlines flight, and you want to say, God, just take me out. It's not working the ball's not moving down the field. We're not making enough of a difference. And you just got to remember, God is the one who cleans up the mess. We serve people. We help them up. We love them. But God's the one who changes hearts. God's the one who's doing the work. God went before you. God goes behind you. God works through you. God works around you. He's the one doing the work. And we get to wake up every day and say, isn't it awesome to serve the Lord in this messy, crazy, insane place? And it is awesome. Love people in their mess. And then that positions us to see opportunities and not obstacles. See opportunities and not obstacles. Um, a while back, this guy came by our church, and he, he wanted to meet with me. And uh, I was at the campus that he came to. I was actually in a meeting with another family, and I didn't even know he came into the building and so he came back a little bit later, and he got really irate and angry and started yelling, and I didn't even know he was there, right? I'm in another room in the church, actually meeting with another church family. We were doing the spiritual growth emphasis, so I was meeting back-to-back -back with different families in the church. So then he comes back that afternoon. I'm not there. I was meeting with a staff member off-site. He's enraged. We offered to have other pastors speak with him to help him. He leaves, whatever. So that's what happened. I didn't even know he came to the church building, but at 5.30 in the morning, because this guy couldn't meet with me, he decides to drive his key through the front doors of our church. I mean, that's one way to get a meeting, right? Not only that, he decides to do a little demolition derby. He drives the Kia all through the lobby, smashes into the walls, does full-blown donuts in our lobby, starts going down the hallways, smashes through the walls, going backstage in the hallways. And then when he's done, he's brought rocks inside the car so he can get out and start smashing holes in the wall and breaking windows. Cops had to tase the guy twice to get him down. Some of you, by the way, we do drive through weddings now in Las Vegas, just throwing that out there. Some of you have had somebody drive through your church recently. Not literally like me, but spiritually. Maybe through gossip, through negativity. They've done a little demolition derby in your heart. They've spun around and they've hit some walls and you know it hurts. So you've been through some church drama. You know because you walk into a restaurant and you see people that you love who turn their back as if they didn't see you. And it hurts. It hurts deep. Some of you are in a place where people closest to you that help you launch your church this is normal, by the way. You hit year two, year three, the dynamic starts to change. You start to see people come to faith in Christ and grow. And those very people that were so influential in the early days of the church as it launched sometimes become the very ones who leave and don't always leave well. And it hurts. And the challenge in those moments is to start looking around. And the temptation is we start seeing obstacles everywhere because we're hurt and we're wounded. And we stop seeing the opportunities. Sometimes we look around through eyes filled with pain and hurt and bitterness, bitterness that we accumulate over the years. And if we don't deal with it, we stop seeing all the little opportunities. I want you to know I've been in ministry 20 years. Uh, 
more than once I've gone to a friend of mine who is a Christian counselor who works with pastors, especially senior pastors. And this last year, I called him up on the phone and I, I talked to him. We don't talk enough about this, but I'm telling you, none of us are beyond seeing a good therapist, a Christian Bible-based therapist to help us keep some sanity in this whole thing. So I'm talking to this guy. He says, Judd, let me tell you what's gone on. For the last 10 years, you've accumulated bitterness in your heart from all of these different hurts. And you've dealt with everybody else's pain and everybody else's bitterness, but you've not dealt with your own. So he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a journal out. I want you to write down all those names of all those people that have hurt you and betrayed you and wounded you. All those names. You know how many it was when I really put a pen to it? It was less than 10. You know how many it felt like before I put a pen to it? About 15,000. And it was so good for me to just write it out and to forgive those people again and to bring them to God again and to realize, man, you're carrying wounds from such a small group and yet you've projected it onto everything. Let God deal with those wounds so that you're free again to see the opportunities. Now, here's this guy on this mat. How many times had he hoped and had his hopes dashed? How many times had he believed that something could actually happen, that he could walk, that he could be healed, and had those hopes dashed and wounded? How easy would it have been for them to look up and see Jesus teaching, and there's people packed out all outside the place, and there's no way you're going to be able to actually get to Jesus? And even if you get to Jesus, he's busy. I mean, how easy would it have been to list out all the obstacles and say, you know what, let's just go home and try again some other time. But these guys saw opportunity where nobody else did. They got past the wounds, and they went up on the roof, and they got crazy for Christ, and they began to lower this guy down. And Jesus, he sees their faith. Look at this, Mark uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. It says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. And you know the story, he goes on and gets in a debate with the religious leaders and then goes on to heal the man so that he can walk. But the greatest gift he gives is the forgiveness of sins because those people saw opportunities instead of obstacles. Friends, what are the opportunities you have? I hope over the next couple of days you get with your teams and you guys dream about the opportunities you have. Some of you, you know, you're tempted to see all the obstacles. Oh, you know, we're set up and tear down, man. Set up, tear down. We're all tired, right? Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? I know we got set up tear down campuses too. I'm not beyond that, right? I got, I deal with, I, we, yeah, I'm there. Well, you don't understand, Judd. You know, I got to show up at 5:30 on Sunday morning. I mean, you guys just roll in. We're taking it for Jesus out here in the portable world. There are unique opportunities that you have because you're mobile that other churches don't have because they're not. There are opportunities that you have because of your size that other churches don't have at their size. There are opportunities in front of you. Don't kill the opportunity without ever giving it a chance because you've been hurt in the past, because it didn't work out in the past, because you tried it before and it didn't work. How many times do you think this guy on the paralyzed mat had tried for healing? But friends, be willing to take risks for Jesus and keep pushing forward and push through the obstacles. You know, one of the things I want to challenge you to do is think about where, who can you serve in your community? What can you do to, to make a difference in the lives of people in your community that maybe isn't currently being done? And then start brainstorming. This is what we've done at Central that's been really helpful for us. We brainstorm around how we can reach specific people. It's easy to talk like, what can we do to reach people for Christ? But Here's what I want to challenge you to do. This is what we do. We put on the board, Dave. Dave is my neighbor. What in the world could we do that could get Dave somehow open to maybe show up at our church campus, to maybe uh, be open to our church, to maybe show up at a Bible study? 
And when you start thinking about it that way, some of our best ideas have come from being very specific. So we'll spend time and we'll say, we're going to take four people and we'll name those four people. We'll talk about who they are specifically and say, all right, how do we reach them? Some of our best ideas, uh, one of our best ideas, it came out of trying to reach my friend's brother. He's like, how do I get my brother to even show up at church? We came up with some crazy ideas and ultimately we did them. And I don't know if his brother ever came or not, but it was awesome. Because it became concrete. And we weren't seeing obstacles anymore. We were seeing opportunities. There are opportunities. Another thing that we encourage our people to do is pray all the time for their lost friends by name. When we get together, look, it's important that you pray for the sick. But you know what? Health is a limited thing. The one thing that we can do on earth or one of the few things that we won't be able to do in heaven is share Christ with our friends and with our family. So when we get together in our ministry environments, I think health is big. I think it's important, but I challenge people, don't start with health prayers. Don't go down the health prayers road because you'll never get back. Start with praying for your lost friends and neighbors. List them by name. Lift them up to Christ. Start all your ministry areas before the uh, service starts. Who are we praying for today that isn't here? Some other things that we do that's practical, we really try to, to move past just gathering a crowd to raising up an army. And the way you raise up an army is you got to teach them how to share their faith with their friends, the right ways to do it, the wrong ways to do it, very practically and very simply. And as you do, the power of that can be tremendous because as people start owning that message, they start willing to get messy. They start seeing opportunities, and you're releasing them into those opportunities. Man, the impact can be exponential. So, friends, this is what we do. Rejoice again in the God who called you, and you'll rejoice again in what he's called you to. Come back to the simple mission of Jesus to seek and save the lost passionately committed to that, and you'll find again the joy of ministry, and you'll find again the courage to love people in the mess, the courage to look for opportunities, even though there's all kinds of obstacles, and you'll find the courage to keep doing it over the long haul. One of my favorite poems is by Samuel Shoemaker. Kept it in my office for years. I still keep it close to me. It's very dear to my heart. It's called I Stand by the Door goes like this. So I stand by the door. I neither go in too far nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It's the door through which people walk when they find God. There's no use my going way inside and staying there when so many are outside who crave to know where the door is. People die outside that door. Like starving beggars die on cold nights in cruel cities in the dead of winter. They die for something that is within their grasp. And they live on the other side of it. They live because they have found it. Nothing else matters to helping them find it and open it and walk in and find Jesus. So I stand at the door. I admire the people who go way in. But I wish they wouldn't forget how it was before they got in. Then they would be able to help the people who haven't even yet found the door or the people who want to run away from God again. Listen, he says, you can go in too deeply and you can stay in too long and you can forget the people outside the door. As for me, I shall take my old accustomed place near enough to God to hear him and know that he is there. But not so far from people as not to hear them and remember that they are there too. Where? Outside the door. Thousands of them, millions of them, but more important for me, one of them, two of them, four of them, whose hands I am intended to put on the latch so I shall stand by the door and wait for those who seek it. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. I'll stand by the door. The question I have for you today is will you join me? Will you be one of those followers of Jesus who stands at the door, who takes the hand of a hurting, broken person and puts it on the latch? Because if they just come to know Jesus, it'll change everything else in their life. Will you be one of those people that loves people in the middle of the mess, 
that walks the tension of grace and truth and doesn't come up with the easy solution just because it's easy, but lives in the tension of that and the struggle of it because you care for those people? And will you be one of those individuals that sees opportunities rather than obstacles and knows that if we can just get our friends to Christ, he can do the rest. He's the one who's gone before us and behind us. He's the one who sets it all up and changes hearts ultimately anyway. Will you stand at the door with me? Let's bow and pray together. God, we're grateful for your love. I thank you for this incredible group of church planners and leaders and people whose heart is that others would come to know and experience your goodness and your grace in Jesus. We thank you for who Jesus is, for his forgiveness and for his patient and steadfast love. We thank you for the goodness that he shows us every day. And God, we just confess today that it is awesome to serve you. I pray for those who are wounded, God. I ask you, heal them. Touch their hearts today. This next couple days, God, inspire them and fill them with your love. Give them joy again. And may we all rejoice in who you are again to find joy in the calling again. God, restore our hearts and restore our joy that we may serve you with all that we are, with every last breath, so that more may come to know you and experience you. Thank you for the privilege of being your servants. Thank you for the privilege of getting to love people. Thank you for the privilege of getting to wake up every day and stand by the door. God, we love you and we praise you and we worship you now. In Christ's name, amen.